It happens all the time. A customer will hear one thing or perhaps see a recommendation on the oil they're buying. And then we tell them another based on the results we see in the sample they send in. And there we have a bit of a conflict. Will the customer trust the label, the advertisement, or will they opt to go by the results in deciding what to do next with their maintenance plan? I'm going to break down one of those very same instances with you today. This sample pertains to an engine that was going 7,500 miles between oil changes. The customer bought an oil that was advertised to be good for 20,000 miles. And so they wondered if the oil looked like it had the amount of use that they put on it and if it could go longer. Here's the situation. The engine is wearing pretty well. Uh, some metals line up perfectly with averages, some of them a bit higher, but nothing really concerning from a wear standpoint. You look at the oil's physical properties, it has a normal viscosity. Low insolubles show the oil filter was holding up well. No issues there. Didn't find coolant, didn't find excess dirt. But there was one point of interest, one thing that kept us from jumping to a 20,000 mile oil change, which as you'll hear later is a bit ambitious to begin with. But the sticking point was fuel. This sample had 2.5% fuel based on the flash point. It's a fairly high level. It's more than we typically find from normal use. Hence the reason we opted to avoid a longer interval, at least in terms of our recommendation, the customer is free to do what they want. But in terms of what we wanted to see on the next sample, we wanted to see another oil run close to 7,500 miles as opposed to a longer interval because we want to know is excess fuel an ongoing, a worsening problem, or is this a blip on the radar? When you're talking about the first sample from an engine, there's so many unknowns, especially when you're talking about like a pre-buy situation or a sample following a repair, a change in ownership, a change in use, especially. And in these cases, you want to grant a certain amount of leeway. Now, of course, there are scenarios where a problem is a problem is a problem. But the thing about fuel is it can be a little tricky. Some engines are prone to fuel system issues, sure. And sometimes you'll see fuel in an engine where you know that's so rare for there to be a fuel system problem. Uh, BMWs come to mind. I almost never see excess fuel in a BMW, especially you know the M3s, the M5s that we see all the time. It's really quite rare to find any measurable fuel. So if I'm in a situation where I suddenly see fuel, especially in an engine where we have trends and you know samples to look back on and see that hasn't been normal for that owner either, I'm inclined to wait and see what happens. Wait and see how the trend develops after you have one result that is a variance from the norm. All that is to say we want to grant leeway when it's due, when there is reason to do so. Especially when you have cases where, you know, customers have been adding, say, a flush or another solvent-based product that can mimic fuel by lowering the flash point. Remember I said earlier that this sample in question, it came from an engine where there was 2.5% fuel based on that flash point a little bit more than we typically see from normal use. So instead of opting to call a problem right off the bat, again, first sample, first impression, we're just getting to know the engine. Now, it's more than we typically see from normal use, but before suggesting a longer run, we want to see if it's lingering or if it's worsening. Because if it is, 
Well, that keeps the oil from doing its job of cleaning and lubricating the engine properly. Fuel, as you probably know if you're here in the first place, but especially if you've been listening to several episodes of the show or you know oil analysis in general, fuel can thin the viscosity significantly. Now, in this case, the viscosity was still good, well within range, so the oil held up just fine. But imagine if we were to suggest a longer interval just because things looked fairly good elsewhere. Then all of a sudden I can picture a likely scenario where a customer comes back and says, hey, you told me to run longer, I had excess fuel, and then things got even worse. What's the deal? What gives? When you have a situation where there is a less than ideal result, there is reason to exercise caution, but also You don't want to go the other end of the spectrum and assume a problem right off the bat unless you have all of these supporting evidence, the added hallmarks of a problem. Now, remember, like I said earlier, everything looked good except for fuel. The viscosity was still okay. Wear metals are okay. Hence the reason we're going to wait and see how the trend plays out. There are ways for fuel to show up other than a fuel system problem. A couple of common scenarios are customers sampling right after they start the engine, say because they need to move the car up onto ramps or they need to reposition the car for an oil change. They start the engine and in that brief amount of time, the engine doesn't have time to warm up completely and get rid of excess fuel from startup and get rid of the fuel from startup, or you'll have situations where customers want to idle the engine uh, before sampling to warm it up. Now, in ideal conditions, I would advise that customers don't do either of these things. It's fine to sample cold if it's cold after you've warmed it up. So what I mean is you go for a drive, you get the engine up to operating temperature, you arrive back home, you shut the engine off, You let it cool enough so you don't burn yourself while sampling. It's okay if it's cold at that point. You know, you've warmed it up to operating temperature before you shut it down. And then you wait till it's cool enough to sample. That's fine. Laying the engine idle before you sample is less than ideal because sometimes idling alone won't get the engine warm enough to cook off the fuel that it needs for startup. So those are ways where fuel can be introduced. And then of course you have the use of additives if they are present. Anything solvent based right before the oil change. So I'm not so much talking about fuel additives that say you've added, you know, some point during the oil change interval and then you're sampling later on down the line. That's not really a factor in fuel if we find it. But sampling conditions, If you're idling or you didn't let the engine warm up all the way, sometimes these factors can cause a less than ideal result. But since we typically don't find upwards of 2% fuel from normal use, there's reason to exercise caution regardless of the oil you're running. Now, this isn't exclusive to fuel either. I don't really care what oil you're running, if there is coolant, if there is excess fuel, if there is you know, abrasive contamination getting past the air filter, if the engine is wearing poorly, these aren't the conditions that the oil was designed to handle. The oil is not designed to stop a problem from existing. I have no doubt that a 20,000 mile run, heck, maybe even longer, could be doable for this engine and the oil in question. But I would only suggest an interval of that nature if there's not issues like harmful contamination. Of course, wear needs to look good. But we also don't suggest jumping to absurd intervals without having a reference for how the engine can handle it. We take a gradual approach with oil change interval recommendations because you can get a good look at how metals are trending and of course how the oil's physical properties are holding up. Rather than an increase of 7,000 to 20, I'd be far more inclined to go say seven to nine or seven to 10,000 miles and then extend the interval from there. 
Far better that than doubling the interval and then coming up to a sample where metals are so off the charts or increasing more than we would expect on a per mile basis. And all of a sudden you have a situation where the engine needs to dial it back and we're playing a game of catch up to find out how far back things need to go. So in addition to keeping an eye out for contaminants or high wear levels, when suggesting longer intervals, we also want to take that gradual approach in the first place. And again, it's not so much about the oil you're running. It rarely is. But in cases where we're finding harmful contamination or signs of poor wear, there's reason to be cautious with the oil change interval rather than asking too much of the engine or the oil. Now I want to switch gears to another scenario where the oil you're running actually does play a crucial role in what might be going on. This instance belongs to a Lycoming engine. It's an IO540 and the owner switched to Phillips 66 Victory. This is an AW oil. We can tell that right away just by the phosphorus that's present in this oil. When the owner switched to this product, we saw an increase in one particular element, that being copper. If you've been around the show for a while, or if you're an aircraft owner that has been using oil analysis, then you know that 1550, an aeroshell product, that tends to cause high copper and lycomings, and it's really not an issue. It's just a harmless reaction, not poor wear. We don't typically see this same result, though, with other oils, but in this case, we're thinking that might well be what's going on, at least for this owner. Now, you never want to make a widespread assumption just based on one instance. So what we're going to do is pay attention to Phillips 66 Victory AW and other Lycoming engines and see if the same trend of an increase with this oil in use is playing out. And in this case, I want to take things even a step further. I want to see if the owner switching to a different oil brings about a decrease in copper. That would be added indication of the oil causing a harmless reaction as opposed to this being a one-off. You know, we're still seeing a trend that can indicate extra wear at brass bronze parts. And importantly, that's something that we don't discount in Lycom engines running 1550 either. We still monitor the trend. If you have a steady increase or spike with that oil in use in a Lycoming, there is still the distinct possibility of poor wear at brass bronze parts, which is why we never look at a result and just write it off. You know, they're there can be so many instances where I think an owner might want to do that very same thing. They hear word on the street is this additive or this oil or so-and-so product will cause this. You know, I was looking at like a fuel additive recently in just an automotive engine and the customer wrote that they had heard it causes high iron. So they were expecting high iron and the sample did in fact have a high iron level, but we also have the context of wherein we have the context of a longer oil run. So I wanted to caution the customer to not assume that this level was just from the additive actually it had a couple other possible sources and we had other metals that we wanted to monitor as well. Long story short, before assuming anything, you want to look at the surrounding context, which is exactly what we do. Sometimes the oil does matter. Absolutely. But when you're making decisions about your maintenance plan, you want to pay attention to what you're asking the oil to do. Oil can stay in use for X amount of miles, of course, under ideal conditions. But when you introduce contamination, when you introduce poor wear, all of a sudden you're asking the oil to deal with things other than the ideal conditions where metals are low, where there's not contaminants, that brings today's episode to a close. My name is Blackstone Joe. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you like what you heard today, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Thanks for listening.